everybody, it's the interviews with Will Alexander, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV. Today in the hot seat we have Mr. Clay Cody. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Hi everybody. Today we have a special guest. We have none other than Mr. Clay Cody. How are you today, Clay? I'm good. Well, how are you? Good. It's good to see you. How's the weather there in the sunny south? It's it's starting to get better. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a record summer heat. Oh, too hot. Yeah. Yes. At least it's a dry heat, though. It's not. So there you go. There you go. That's why you you dry out and your skin starts hanging. <laughs> nice. Dribbling up. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get right right to it. Um, tell me how you got first involved in the sport of dogs, Clay. Well, it was really an accident. I was working at a stable at cleaning stalls so that I could ride these rental horses for free. And the people had a dog, um, an, an Amer toy which today is called a Toy Fox Terrier, and the breed looks exactly the same. And the owners of the stable asked me, she was bred, and they asked me if I would like to have a puppy, and I said, sure. So I went to my next door neighbor, and uh, he, I asked him to build me a doghouse. He was a carpenter. And How old were you, Clay? Twelve. Okay. Seventh grade. So I, uh, uh, he asked me what size, and I said, well, about like this and like this. And uh, he said, what are you getting? I said, I'm getting an Amber toy, which at the time was, a, was registered by the UKC, not the AKC. So he said, uh, you don't want a Amber toy. He says, you want a Samoid. Well, he just happened to have a friend that had a litter of Samoids. So we went over there, and we... They were. I mean, at Samoyed puppies at eight weeks old, they don't get any cuter than that. And, and I took my choice. And um, the guy owed him a favor, so I was able to buy this dog for $40. My father gave me $40 to buy this dog. So then, fast forward, a few months later, um, there's a local dog show in Arizona, and these people showed their dogs. And so they asked me if I would show my dog and I said sure I'd be glad to I'd love to and uh, so in the day the uh, Sewer State Kennel Club had uh, dog training classes every Saturday at some little park in Phoenix and uh, I took my dog over there and I learned how to handle her and I and one of the people that were teaching at the time was Dixie McCauley now that's a name that most people will not remember it's boxer people she's pretty well known in the breed in the day in the 60s we're talking like 1962 so um uh they you know i i did the thing every week i was enthusiastic about it i enjoyed it and uh they entered her at the dog show they entered her in the american bread class and uh the time the entry fee was six dollars which i thought was like exorbitant <laughs> But uh, uh, I showed her, and uh, first I took her to a grooming shop, and I got her bathed, and I got her trimmed. His, uh, his, the groomer was an old, old handler from Glenview, Illinois, by the name of Harlan Schwander, which, again, I don't think there's anybody alive other than me that remembers Harlan Schwander. So he had, he had been... Um, he lost his license for um, punching out a judge in Kankakee, Illinois. <laughs> and he was an old alcoholic. All my role models basically were alcoholics. 
So uh, anyways, he, he bathed her and trimmed her up and and I went to the show and I had this big box that I kept her in and my father dropped me off at six o'clock in the morning and I sat there with my dog and I brushed on her and brushed on her and then I went in and showed her. Well, she, you know, she had a far too long a nose and she's a little bit low on leg and, and none of these things I realized, but she was the cleanest and the whitest dog there. And, um, uh, there were two in the class, and she went second. <laughs> but they also had a junior showmanship class, and I was eligible to do that. And the day you signed up, and the, they had a professional handler uh, judge the class. And I went into the novice class, and there were six kids in there, and I was third. So I thought, well, that's okay, but going second in the class. So the next day I decided that, which was the Superstition Kennel Club, which is in Mason. We went to the Superstition Kennel Club. And same thing happened. It went second in a class of two. And I thought, uh, I got to get another dog because this isn't working for me. I mean, I was immediately competitive. I wanted a blue ribbon no matter what. And um, so I met some very, very well, very well known Samoyed people. A woman by the name of Jean Blake, who had a, um, she was showing a dog called um, uh, Shoshone of Whitecliffe, and Whitecliffe was a very famous Samoyed kennel at the time. And that lady taught me to trim the feet and uh, the whiskers, and and uh, was very encouraging to me. Um, and then um, by the the next group of shows, I had another Samoyed, and she was a little better, and she could win the American Bread class. Where I really got going well was um, uh, a couple years later, the Samoyed comes running through the front yard, and I captured him. And I kept him hostage until somebody put an ad out that there was a dog missing. So I called the people up and I said, I think I have your dog. His name was Siska Broken Bow. He was a dog from Morrison, Colorado. And at the time, there were several really good Samoy kennels in Morrison, Colorado. And these people were wealthy oil people. And they had bought this dog for their children when they were born. And uh, Siska was a good dog. And they put my name on the dog and let me show him. And uh, I showed him in a puppy match. I won the working group under a judge called Frank Hayes Birch, who some people still remember. Uh, then um, uh, I took him out. First show, I got a five-point major on him under Billy Pym from Canada. Do you remember him? Billy. Billy Pym. No, I don't know. Yes, he's a very well-known judge in Canada. He would be... Um, he would be comparable to Jimmy Reynolds or somebody like that. This is all in the 60s. Yeah, okay. Hmm. And, uh, you know, this is my first five-point major and, and uh, first point, and I was thrilled. Um, so fast forward, you know, I was in the seventh grade when I got started, and when you're in the seventh grade, your teachers are trying to point you towards some kind of vocation. And I couldn't think of anything that I wanted to be, anything. I know there was nothing I wanted to do. And um, so when I got to this show, the first day, I mean, before I ever showed my dog, I thought, wow, these people are showing these dogs and they're traveling all over the country and this looks like fun. And, and I was just immediately, this is what I'm going to be, a dog handler. And in true story, I never looked back. I never look back. I, that was my business. But I did, it affected my grades in school because I didn't care about school anymore. I'd go to school every day and just draw pictures of dogs or read anything I could about dogs. I had every magazine you could get, and, and uh, that was it. So then a little bit further forward. Well, the, first of all, let me get back to the guy that I first had my dog groomed at. On the Monday after the show, I rode my bike over to his grooming shop, and he gave me a job bathing dogs, and I bathed dogs for him a couple of years. 
Then, and he's the one that told me that I should work for Larry Downey. So, uh, I, in the meantime, Ben Brown moved to town. Now, ben Brown was the, uh, was the was the person that taught Harry Sankster, he taught Rick Kashudian. Yeah, I mean, and he was old and he had asthma and he had moved from California to Arizona. And, and uh, uh, I worked for him, I painted his kennel. He never paid me anything, but um, uh, he, was, he was an icon in the business. So, um, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick story. When you can get a driver's license when you're 15 years and nine months, and I, a learner's permit, I got a learner's permit. I had never driven, ever. I hadn't even sat on my father's lap. So we were going to California, and he was a big, heavy set man, and he got in the in the passenger side. And I said, I don't know, I drive it was a three-speed Ford Econo line, you know, with the motor in between, so you're looking straight down at the ground, and it's a and it's a stick, and he's and he's teaching me, telling me, put your foot on the clutch, start giving a little gas, let your clutch, let clutch up, put it in the second gear, push up, go up. And um, we go out of town, but we're, you know, <laughs> you can imagine what that looked like. We were chugging down the road, you know, every time I was trying to put the thing up and trying to learn it. So we got, finally got out of Phoenix and we're going to California. And, um, and you were uh, driving. Huh? You were driving. I was driving. He went to sleep. And he didn't wake up until we were, this is in the summer. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's hot. And in Arizona, what we did, because we, we, had, we didn't have air conditioning, we filled the buckets of all the dogs with ice and we opened all the windows and we drove and, and so he said to me, they need, they need to have, have air and they need to have water. So we would go. Anyways, we went and we woke up and uh, he woke up. No, actually he didn't wake up. I, I'm in the middle of rush hour traffic in Los Angeles and I can't get over. I don't know how to use the mirrors. And I finally I started yelling at him and I woke him up and, and he said, I, I said, I got to get out of here. I'm scared to death. So he looks in the, in the mirror and he says, you can go, you can get, you can get in the next lane. Finally, we got off there and then he started driving. So that was, I learned that. I learned how to drive from this man. <laughs> so then. Um, uh, yeah, three in the fire, they'll just go and do it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so uh, things weren't going well with my family. They weren't interested in dogs at all. And um, uh, I got a job. There's a story about that one too, with Larry Downey. And uh, that's probably the one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, God was truly watching me. You know, He was watching over me because. I ended up with a, a, a couple, very hardworking, talented uh, business people, and uh, and they had a little, they had a farmhouse in Libertyville, Illinois, and they had a little little room in the back, or actually had to go outside to get to the room, and they asked me if you wanted to, if I would stay there, and I said sure. You know, it had a, a couch that had a bed that rolled out, and then that was like a, it looked like a roller coaster. And I slept in that bed for three and a half years, actually four, because after they quit, I still stayed there for four months before I got married to Bergen. So, um, but the thing is with those people and the work ethic and the fact that, and they were doggy, and, and uh, you know, there was an AKC book of standards on the kitchen table every night, and, and there were always questions. and, and you know, they'd be reading it and I'd be reading it. And we would talk about dogs, dogs, dogs. And they, they, God, they didn't have any children. So I became, actually became their child. And, uh, uh, you know, when I think about it years and years later, I could have been, I could have gotten into, 
and I didn't know where I was going. I went to Illinois, you know, as a so actually I was not even 17 years old. I was, I started working for him on June 20th. My birthday was until June 30th and I turned 17. I lied to them. I told them that I was 18 because I didn't think they would hire me. And, um, and I work like, like a slave. I mean, these people said, you know, you have no self-discipline and you need to work for somebody that's strong. And I'm telling you, I learned words that I never heard of before when he was yelling at me. I mean, and most of them were, it was calling me. So, <laughs> you know, so, you know, people need to understand that because, you know, Birgit and I had some really good help and a lot of them are very good. They, they make a living showing dogs. They don't just do it sure. as a, a hand, you know, as, as, uh, what do they call it? The glory trail. So I learned how to save money. That's an important thing. If you're going to be handling, I also learned that you had to charge regardless. And it was very difficult when you start handling, it's very difficult to charge people because you, you don't feel that you are good enough. And I, we charged and, and we kept it a business. And, and when Bert and I got married, we, uh, have, we didn't have two cents to, to rub together. Yeah. Let's just back up. Tell me how you met Birgit and how that all started. Okay. Um, then we'll go from there and go into. Okay. Well, Birgit actually comes from the same cloth. She basically left home young. I basically ran away from home. She basically ran away from home too. She went to England from Germany, from Hamburg, Germany, and she got a job in a, um, a kennel maid school in the day they had kennel maid schools. And then a lady by the name of Betty Malinka, who was the city clerk for the city of Gary, Indiana, had Scotties, Sand Doom Scotties, and she met Bergert over there and asked if she would come to the United States. And she did, and they went to dog shows, and uh, we'd be there set up, and when they would get there with the Scotties and the Westies, uh, they'd set up, and I'd see them over there, and then all of a sudden they were set up behind us. She'd move everything, all of her crates, her tent, everything, and she was right behind us. So after a while, you know, I kind of figured, well, this girl, I mean, and this went on show after show, and I thought, wow, maybe this girl likes me. So you know, we became good friends, and, and um, then I was uh, off one day a week, Tuesdays, and I would always go to her place, and then... Uh, and work the rest of the week and uh, uh, it started from there and uh, and it, we were a great team actually once we got married nine, we got married in 1970 um, we were a great dream great team we worked oh, yeah. hard we, and we had nothing and uh, and we it paid off working hard you know we, we eventually uh, did very well, and uh, but me being coming from Arizona, I worked for Larry and Alice for three and a half years. Another six months after he retired, then Bergen and I got married, and then we lived there for another three years. And you know, when you're from Arizona and you're used to 300 bright sunny days a year, uh, and it's it snows all winter, it rains all spring, it's hot, humid in the summer, and, and you know, we're taking care of dogs outside, exercise them, we're out there, it's snowy, I'm out there picking poop out of the snow, you know, it's, it's... Where are you now? This was still in Libertyville, Illinois. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, it, it just, it wasn't good. And I finally told Berger, and, and, and we were able to buy a nice house at that time in St. Charles, Illinois, and, and it was beautiful, and I loved it, and I landscaped it, and, and uh, it worked out well. But I, I said to Berger one day, I said, you know, I'm going to jump off the roof and kill myself. I cannot take another day living in Illinois, and I want to move back to Arizona. So... In the day, there was no money in Arizona, and the drive going back from California, you have to make most of shows in California, that was too much. So again, we get back to Ben Brown, and he found me a place, found us a place, 
in Libertyville, not Libertyville, I'm sorry, Palmdale, California. And we worked out of there for two years. And then one day, Rick Kishudian called me and says, Kid, I need you to buy my kennel. I said, okay, put the kennel on sale, on, up for sale. We were, it was sold and we were ready to move in six months. So I said, Rick, we're ready to move. Okay, come on down, kid. Well, he didn't have any plans of moving. So we move in there. You know, and at the time, he's doing those those bronzes, and he's got this wax, and, and he's got this Bunsen burner, and he walks around the place with a cigar in his mouth, and he's whittling on these dogs, and all day long, he's doing this. And, and the, the place, this place looked like a, a, a yellow paint bomb went off out of it. The carpet was yellow. The building was inside. It was yellow. The outside, it was yellow. The fence in the front was falling down onto the sidewalk. It was a mess. And so I didn't know that cockroaches liked that wax from all that wax falling on the carpet, the yellow carpet. As you could tell, it was yellow because it was, looked black. And the place was full of cockroaches. It was a mess. So, you know, I mean, most people know that Berger is very fastidious and very clean and very organized. And she wants things done right. Well, she, I, I thought she was going to either kill me or Rick. And uh, when we moved down there, we had um, uh, Marippi worked for us, Bernie Cush worked for us, Doreen Higuchi, who, if you don't know who she was, she was she's the late, she's the gal that eventually married Joe Waterman. Oh, okay. So she worked for us. Andy Linton worked for us only on the weekends. So we're all there, and then Rick has got all of his employees in the back room working on these molds and, and we're trying to clean the place up and he's got his dogs there. We have our dogs there. He was married to Sandy Kashudian at the time and, and uh, it was the biggest mess you ever saw. So believe it or not. Did he, he tell you he was staying? St well, he had an apartment. We, uh, we, we had, we had a, a, a four year old son, Ryan. And we, the area is, it's, it's, it's an industrial area in, in, in Sun Valley, California. We called it Slum Valley. A uh, lot of kennels there. Uh, Woody Warnell lived there. So, anyway, a, a year later, uh, Rick moved. Rick and Sandy moved. He moved to Louisiana. And uh, I actually, <laughs> As much hell as I put Birgit through by making her go through all that, and Marippi. Marippi and Birgit got very close, and they I do believe they were planning on buying a gun and killing him. And maybe two. Me too. <laughs> great. It was unbelievable. But what a lesson. You know, Larry Downey was a great teacher. But Rick, in his own right, is a great teacher. He's a great trimmer. And, and he can explain things just beautifully so you could really understand them. I, I, he just had a gift of gab, and, and he could do that. And he was willing to do that. So well, that was a very big positive in my life, and in an actual Burgess life, too, but, but even though she hated him and she was impossible to live with at that time. She got better once he moved. <laughs> we had a pretty good life for a while there, quite a while. But uh, um, uh, you know, there's stories I could tell you. But anyway, we're, we're still trying to get down to how I got into the business and what happened. And, and the yeah, this is great. Just keep rolling. <laughs> um, and Rick, Rick, I have to give him credit. He was a great teacher, and they taught me a lot. And. Um, uh, and we, Berger and I, we lived there for 20 years. We worked out of that place, and, and it was, we cleaned it up. Believe me, we cleaned it up. And, uh, uh, and it was just like Rick said, you know, it was a, uh, a gold mine. In pet grooming, did a lot of pet grooming. And this I was taught from Larry, because I did pet grooming there. Uh, Boarding, he did anything he could to make money because at the time, the AKC and the PHA, not the PHA, 
the American Kennel Company controlled handlers. You had to, number one, have a, a kennel. And that actually turned out to be a godsend for me. You know, we did everything that the AKC, which was Len Brumby, controlled it. Uh, we did everything that he said. You know, he even told me one time, I want you to wear um, a blue coat and tan pants. And I did it. So, but anyways, uh, then they, PHA was going to sue, or actually it was Rick. <laughs> they were going to suspend and the PHA got behind him. And um, that's when Bob and Jane were ahead, or Jane, uh, Bob was head of the PHA at the time. And uh, the AKC threw up their hands and said, okay, we're not going to have any more control over professional handlers. And I thought, well, that's very good. That's very good. But it turned out it wasn't very good, you know, because, uh, you know, there was an apprentice program in the day. Now, you know, we're talking from the 60s, and, and um, they stopped about the late 70s, early 80s is when the AKC gave up and said no more. No more licensing handlers and licensing assistances. Assistance. I think we wouldn't with the with the qualifications they had back then. We probably wouldn't have half the handlers we have now. No, no. And uh, well, the main thing is is that you know so many of them work out of their garage now. That's not a good deal, you know. By keeping the kennels, and when, by the way, when all this stopped, the AKC, you know, a lot of people sold their kennels. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, that's where a lot of them could have retired. And on the money that you know, with inflation, that those kennels became with that property alone, kennel property alone in Los Angeles is very difficult to get and very expensive. Sure. So, um, um, we 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 pretty much stayed the way old school type stuff, and you know, you know, they used to talk about old school when I was young, and I think, oh, you're crazy, but believe me, it 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 helped, and and it. I actually think the AKC should get back into watching it because I, yeah. I, I don't see as many things, bad things happening as I did in the 60s, uh, but uh, I'm sure there's some going on and you know, I don't know what's happening. So um, nonetheless, we worked hard. You know, we were a good team, you know, uh, with Burger King did was she was the opposite of me she could she did books she was organized and she taught me a lot and the one thing she really taught me was saving money so and during that time we had a lot of good people a lot of kids coming in from japan and, and scandinavia assistance really some good ones they came there because they wanted to learn like i did uh, I mean, I went there, I worked for $40 a week for three and a half years, never asked for a raise, and they never thought about giving me a raise either. <laughs> but I went to learn. <laughs> so, um, and that's what a lot of them did, you know. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of successful ones. You know, Greg Strong is a good businessman. He works hard. He runs, you know, he's a good, good solid person. Um, he comes to mind, but there's dozens more. And... Uh, Marippi, she started working for us right after college. She was the cutest, prettiest little girl you ever saw. And funny, she could keep me laughing. I mean, she kept me laughing every day. I mean, she was the highlight of my day most of the time, till the end, yeah. which wasn't a real happy ending, but no endings are, I guess. Not in this business, but uh, uh, but I would say that you know as as we were learning and she went through the Rickashudian experience and and she she saw all this and and things were wild in the day with us. I mean, we were, we were just nonstop all the time. And um, but I would say I would make her really the best assistant that we ever had. And I think she worked there for five, maybe six years. Then I handled dogs again out of Arizona, which is very difficult. The driving would drive you crazy. And you know, the, the, the truck that I had had to have 
two generators and three air conditioners on it because you would go from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 114 degrees to Houston, Texas, where it's 105 degrees with humidity and you'd have 25 dogs in this truck and four employees. Yeah. And uh, I, I lived in fear of a, of, a, of a flat tire getting stuck out in the middle of the desert and, or the motor going out. So we you know, I took very good care of those trucks and knocked on wood and we never had any problems. Uh, and Birgit did too. She took very good care of those trucks, and uh, uh, you know we were always putting new tires on them because I just hated changing tires. Mm. So, always thought of the worst case scenario and, and tried to avoid that. And, uh, Great planning. A lot of us don't do that. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I ran out of gas once, and that's the last time I ever ran out of gas. That's a pain in the neck too. So. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I get those stories until you go, you know, you'd be sick of listening to them, but I, we won't, we'll try and bypass it and, and just get this, this history going. Uh, and not, so anyways, I moved here and, and, uh, uh, and I finally bought a piece of property that uh, I had known about because I was raised here. And it, it was a real rundown dump, but it had a license. You know, uh, a kennel license is very hard to do, and and it was grandfathered in, and uh, it, I bought it, and, and I, I spent more money on attorneys keeping it a kennel because it was, it was now it's in a residential area, and it's in a very exclusive city in Paradise Valley where you know they, you have to have an acre to have a house, and they don't want businesses in that town, and and then long story short, the city after years became very, very good to me after a two year lawsuit because I, I did what I promised them I'd do. I told them I would make it beautiful and I did. So uh, the kennel, I don't think you really want to hear so much about. It's just the history. I showed the dogs out of here, you know, and um, it's very fortunate. Both of us were very fortunate. We got good dogs. We got good clients. Good clients are very important as you know, and good dogs are important. I mean, there was a period of time there when we were in California that Birgit and I were both, I mean, we were golden and, and we had more clients than we could, but most of the clients just finally left. I couldn't find them dogs that I wanted to show. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they would go by the wayside. And, I think of the potential these people had. The, the mere fact that they had the interests, they wanted to spend the money, and they wanted a good dog. And hard to find. Nowadays. I'm sorry. That's hard to find nowadays. It is nowadays. But seriously, I mean, I guess that was in the the golden days of the dog shows. You know, I, I think about it. I mean, it was a lot of interest in dogs. This was when Santa Barbara was beautiful, and Beverly Hills was beautiful. And, the Chicago International was the great Chicago International, and Westminster, and da 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 da. You know, great show. The, so. A few weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Kenny Kenny Murray, and he he touched on you quite a bit. Can you tell me how you two met? You you guys became yeah. so close. Yeah, <laughs> I can't tell you everything. It was some yeah, of. Them. Of course <laughs> not. We don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I met him on the Texas circuit and um, uh, he's my age and he really did have the same interests I do. He had the same drive and uh, I, I was showing a Labrador. The dog was a, a gift to me from Larry. It was a bitch, a pick of the litter that people couldn't afford the board bill and we got it. And the bitch was. And this uh, the dog was sired by uh, Shamrock Acres Light Brigade, and his name was Hillsborough Wizard of Oz. And the story with him was, I we went on the circuit, and we were on the circuit, and I got to know Ken, and in on that circuit it was ten shows, I finished that dog undefeated in the breed from the classes. Now that's hard to do with a Labrador. It'd be much harder to do today than it was then. But in that circuit, I got a second in the group under Phil Marsh and a second in the group under Andy Clark. You know, showing him myself. 
And uh, pretty soon, uh, Ken was, he was following us to the shows. And then pretty soon I was riding with him, following them. You know, and every, in the day, every show was the Texas circuit. You, you drove after every show, you know. You got there, you fed, you exercised, you got all set up, you went to bed at one o'clock in the morning, you got up at six o'clock or five o'clock in the morning because you had to be there at six. And um, uh, so we we stayed in touch. We stopped to him all the time on the phone. Then we'd go down to Texas, and um, uh, he had a, a limited at the end of the day. They gave limited handler's licenses, and he had a limited handler's license. And uh, I said to him, I said, you know, you've got to work for a handler. You know, you just, you can't do this just from pure love or, or, or drive. Uh, I mean, some people have, but it doesn't work for most of them. So I got him a job. Um, I, didn't get, I talked him into working for Dick Cooper. And this was when uh, Larry and Alice were quitting. And um, he had, Dick Cooper had a guy by the name of Harry Hayes that was working for him, and he was leaving. And I said, you know, please come and work for this guy, or, you know, help me. So, okay, he went there, and I, and I said to him, I said, you know, he's got a, a daughter, and uh, she's a little bit sketchy, and, and uh, don't, don't <laughs> get near this girl. I mean, she's a little difficult. And, so long story short, well, three months short, she's pregnant in three months, right? So Ken doesn't listen to me. <laughs> and um, and then, <laughs> then, you want to talk about the apprentice of all time, you end up working for him for 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that was um, that was fun and interesting, and it was good, you know, that when, when he moved there, then I had somebody to pal around with. And we talked about dogs and dogs and dogs. That's all we talked about were dogs, and, uh, which is good. We both had the same interest. I mean, and again, uh, let me go back to Burger real quick. That was our interest also. You know, I was very fortunate that I found Burgett because we did have the same interest, the same drive, and, and all that sort of thing. Was, and same thing with Ken. Um, so uh, then, then uh, I think Ken already had two children, and then Burgett and I moved to California because I was going to jump off a roof. And uh, so my, my, yes, I'm repeating myself. So Ken, uh, it's a lot of fun and, and I still hang out with him. And, uh, and that's all we talk about are dogs, dogs, stories, stories until you make you sick. And, uh, um, and I always tell people, you know, I got him his job, his first job. If you did anything right, it was because of me. <laughs> Nothing to do with Nick Cooper or anybody else. <laughs> you basically started as a Samoids. What is your favorite breed now? You know, I, people always ask me that. It's, it really depends on the dog. Yeah. You know, the dog. I, 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 you know, I fall in love with dogs all the time. And... Um, and I've been, again, I'll, I've been very lucky, and, and um, probably my favorite dog was, he's, he's my best story in dogs, and my biggest heartache in dogs was my Wire Fox Terrier, George. George, yeah. And, um, I was working for Bobby Stebbins the year you came on the Florida circuit, I think you won like every best in show, I can't remember. I, 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 know, I think I missed two of them. But I think there were what nine shows, and he won seven. Yeah, Bobby and that, always sent me to watch you show. Go watch Clay show a wire. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great dog. I mean, really, it was probably uh, uh, I would say one of the two really great dogs that I ever showed, and and he was such a wonderful dog to show. And then, then, and then, one of the biggest hardest things for me to learn and it took me too long to learn it because I, I I'm going through this uh, huge problem and I and I don't understand it and I don't know why and I'm blaming everybody else 
But what he had was uh, petite mal seizures. He was starting epilepsy. And then eventually he had grand mal seizures, and then you could see it. So that was very sad. But probably the greatest win that I ever had in Dodge, the most fun win or the most hardest win, was winning the breed at the Garden when Peter had uh, Galsall Excellence out. And he was the number one dog all breeds. And, and, um, and then the following night, showing him for best and show he was going he was in a seizure when he walked into the ring and i literally was just holding him up and and that was the worst the worst but um yeah and then uh, blossom and my lakeland bitch she was she was so much fun oh, yeah. um, you remember mrs whitmore up here eve whitmore do i what you remember eve whitmore the judge what? He loved that bitch. He talked about that bitch all the time. Did she? Yeah. Yeah. Canada has some good judges. They really do. I, mean, I, I can't say how much I like Jimmy Reynolds and, and Jenny Lynn and, and a few others. But uh, those two come to mind. And, and there was. We talked about Terriers. Mrs. Whitmore always brought up that bitch. Really? Yeah. 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 She was fun. She was. <laughs> she was a house pet. She really was. She was one of the first house pets that I had as a dog. That's and the reason for that is <laughs> when I came to work for Larry. Let's go back to that story. And I had my dog, my dog Sam, my Samoyed Siska, and he said, "What is that?" And I said, "Well, that's my dog." And um, he said, "Do you see all these dogs in this kennel?" He says, they're all your dogs when they're here. Yeah. Get rid of them. And I did. I gave them to an uncle that had lived in Illinois, and he had a good life on a farm. Sure. But uh, I say that to help all the time when they, they come up with their dog. Do you see all these dogs in this kennel? They're all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Love them. If I, and, and I'll take a good example of that. Is, you know, you, you may not know Bernie Cush. Bernie Cush was a standard schnauzer breeder and a carry breeder. And she had a dog named Callahan, a carry, that she'd been showing. And she brought him, and I said to her, Do you see all these dogs in this kennel? They're all yours. Get rid of them. Collecting dogs is a bad habit. I was taught that. <laughs> Which that can easily happen. You can collect dogs all day. And if you're going to be in the business and you're supposed to be making a living in it, you need to take care of your clients' business, your clients' dogs, and worry about them. You don't have time to worry about your own dogs. And it works out just as well, believe me. But anyway, she let that dog go to, to England, and that was kind of a sad story. He went best and show at Crufts. Uh, the people kind of, according to her, stole the dog from her. And then I... Pretty, pretty sure that uh, the, the super dog, Carrie, that Bill McFadden showed, came dog down from that dog twice. And, um, and, uh, and, and I love that Carrie. I thought that was a great dog. But, you know, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's the way it's supposed to be, I guess. You know, the dog did great things for the breed, this Callahan, and, and you know, she blamed me for making her get rid of the dogs. And she, that's, that's one of the stories that we talk about doing that. But, but you know, it's, we're talking about professional handlers. That's one of the things. That's the way and the kind of things I was taught. Yeah. That you're taking care of your clients' dogs, and they are your own dogs while they're in your care. Very true. That story, which is the history of my life, I just, when I start talking, I get off on the different side. <laughs> it's great, though. <laughs> so, uh, are there any dogs that you uh, wish you'd been involved with over the years? Wish you had shown? Well, uh, as I just mentioned him, uh, the carry of um that bill had yeah mick yeah when um i was quitting that year that was in 2000 
or 99, 99. And I, I saw the dog at Devon. And I was really taken with him. And I, I never put my hands on him, but I watched somebody go over him one time. I watched him go like, you know, and put their hand from his neck all the way through his shoulders, all the way through his uh, tail and, and uh, back porch and everything else. And just, uh, and I thought, wow, it really is a good dog. But then, you know, Bill McFadden is a, is a talent. You know, in the day and in the days when I showed, um, I, I showed a lot of carries, and um, a lot of them in the 70s and 80s were crazy, just crazy. They go, they get into the ring, they start fighting, they start vomiting, that white foam that came out of them, you know. And um, uh, but Bill, the last two carries that I saw him show our campaign. They were stand-up show dogs, which is the way I preach today about terriers. They're, I, I don't like it when people spar them because, you know, I've had to I've had to spar dogs just because you didn't really want to see them. You know, simply <laughs> where you can make them look good. But nowadays, it's the, the whole terrier world has changed in in the fact that terriers have to do and they, and they are for the most part. People are, are getting smarter. They have to do what a Doberman does. They have to do what a boxer does. And, you know, they have to do what the dog, a stand-up show dog that shows on their own. And you, this business of sparring them drives me crazy. I try never to spar terriers. I don't like it. You know, it, it destroys some dogs. It makes some dogs look very good for just one minute. And what do you have when you have a dog that's a, looks absolutely fantastic sparring? And then he goes around the ring and he, you know, looks like a ride at Disneyland or something. It's just ridiculous, you know. So, you know, you think, oh, wow, I'm going to put that dog over. Okay, let's stick him around and like, oh, no, no, I got to rejudge this class, you know. So I try not to spar dogs. And, and I'm one of the few ter pe terrier people that, that do, but no, terriers can be shown like all the rest of the other breeds and they can be stand up show dogs. So. Uh, what, what year do you start judging then? You retired in. I, I wasn't going to judge. Huh? You retired in 1999 or 2000? About 2000, actually. Okay. But I, I wasn't going to judge, and I think in probably 2002 or 2003. And it was Ken Murray. <laughs> he calls me. He says, if you're going to judge, there. this is the last time that you can get 26 breeds. At the time, and you know, they change that all the time, but you can get 26 breeds. And I said, All right, I'll, you know, I'll try it. So I applied for 26 breeds, and I applied for dogs I liked or dogs I felt comfortable with in all 26, uh, sorry, in all seven groups. And I had 13. Um, working dogs because I wanted to work get the working group first. I did not want the terrier group because if you're going to judge terriers, especially in the beginning and you get like into the certain areas up in the Dakotas and the Midwest and the deep south and sometimes the wrong time of the year, you know, you'll get 25 terriers. You know? It's not worth going there. So I wanted the working group and um, I finished my all my provisionals fast and I applied for the working group and uh, let's see they must have had because I could get 13 more and I had 13 26 well they added three more breeds to it and the AKC gave me those three breeds also so they actually gave me 17 breeds the second time and then I had the working group and uh, uh, the, the AKC has been very good to me you know, I tried my best, tried to keep the clothes clean, uh, which isn't easy for me. Uh, and they, um, they've been good. I have no problems. And the, but, you know, I've, it's been like I'd go four or five years without applying for dogs, you know, any more breeds. And, and uh, you know, I, my kennel, I built a huge kennel. And, 
you know, got interested in that. And, and actually, as, as a matter of fact, when I built it, I didn't plan on quitting handling. It just became so lucrative that I thought, well, I just better, I would, I would prefer to stay home and pick up poop and go to these dog shows where we're, that were driving me crazy at the time. You know, and, and help wasn't as easy to find in those days. It really wasn't. You know, I mean, towards the end there, I had some really good, really good guys. One of them was Jorge. Mm. Jorge was was excellent help. Another one was um, is Chewy. Do you know Chewy in Texas? No. Texas. Oh, what's his name? I only call him Chewy. <laughs> Anyways, he was good. I, I had several at the end there, but but I was at the the last two dog shows that I made as a handler, and. <laughs> I had uh, I had Jorge had quit, Vicky had quit. They all got out on their own, and someone else quit. And I had one good kid. Two others that had worked for me. There had been some dog shows that were okay, and then a new kid that had just come from Mexico to become a handler. Okay. He brought a camera with him, and that he got to the dog show, and that's the last I ever saw him. He's out taking pictures of everything, and that was a uh, so disgusting. And I had a full load of dogs. I won seven groups in two days. Went best in show the first day, and I didn't win the group with that dog the second day, but I still won seven groups. And I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, you know, and it was just such an exasperating re weekend for me. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I think I'd just rather stay home and pick up poop and go through this, this mess. And that's what I did. <laughs> but, I, but anyways, so I, I, he asked me about judging. And Ken called me a couple years later and said, you better do it now. And I said, okay. And I thought, well, I wouldn't know if I'd like judging or not. And, and, and judging, by the way, is, is, is on-the-job training also. You may think you know about dogs. You may know about dogs, and you may have read that standard 20 times, but you really have to judge each individual breed. And it's best if you judge them around the country so you can see what each part of the country has to offer because it's not always the same. Yeah. You know, you can get Labradors in one area, for example, and get some fabulous dogs. Enjoy it. I mean, like, it's fun to judge them. You know, in the next week, you could be doing... 30 Labradors and somewhere else, I won't say where. And it's like, oh my God, this is painful. So, but it is, it's, it's something I don't know a lot of people think about, but it's, it's you really have to do it. And, and, I, and when I can remember start, when I first started judging, and I, I still do when I judge, you know, it's like, oh my God, can I get five minutes off to read this standard again, you know? But again, you learn. That's the way you learn, is on-the-job training. And don't tell me anybody ever started judging, went out there and didn't go, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? You know, it takes a while to understand it and, and to get the feel for it. And, and when you're judging a lot, there was a point there where I was judging 40 weekends a year, you know, you get into the groove. And... Um, you know, and then a lot of the things that, that help you as being a handler, and, and, they, and they, it helps if you want to be helped, is the fact that, you know, you, you, you get people that say things to you, and, 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 and you, it's in code. You know what they're saying to you, and, you know, they're, they're pimping this dog, and you know that. You know, it's like, you know, don't piss on my boots and tell me it's raining, brother. I've done this for 40 years, you know. <laughs> I waited behind poles and waited for those judges to walk around there and so I could start up a conversation and get my quote unquote code in there. So, but, uh, so, you know, the only reason for judging that I can see that anybody would want to do is that it is definitely a challenge. Yeah. And it's challenging. And it can only, it, it only benefits me, the judge. It only benefits the judge and the fact that you can walk out of there and say, Wow, I really liked, I really thought I did a good job today. But on the other hand, I've also walked out of there and goes, man, I screwed that up. Why did I do that? You know, it's, 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 it's just, 
the way it is, I guess. I think that's natural, you know, second guess yourself sometimes. Right, right. You know, it used to be I knew if, who, who was a good judge, I knew who was a crook, I knew who was, was everything, and that's the way I treated them. <laughs> You're a crook? Okay, you want to be a crook? I'll take care of you. You know, you want to be a good judge? I'll give you all the respect in the world, you know, so. But it's, it's, it's different, and actually, as I'm judging, there are some people that are some, some real, actually really good judges out there, really good. And then there's a few that uh, I don't think will ever learn. You know, they just they, some people just don't have it, right? They can't. So. Right. Yeah. Hey, next question. All right. <laughs> if you had to, um, let's say, uh, who, who, if you had, to, who would you like to have had, have dinner with in dogs of dog people that have passed? Who, who would you wish you could still speak? To? Um. Let's start with Langscarda. I thought he was the most complete, down-to-earth gentleman in the business. Yeah. And he pulled no punches. You know, if he was judging a dog and there were 20 people in the ring and they could all stand there, and he would say to you, okay, Will, take this dog down and back. Okay, Will, take the dog around. Okay, it's not like it's... Uh, oh, I got to pretend I don't know you, and then he could still judge the dogs, right? Oh, for sure. I used to love that. I used to love that, and the, the fact that he just absolutely was not phony about nothing. He was down to earth. You could talk dogs to him, and uh, and he had some great stories. I, I I had dinner with him many times, and I loved him. And the same thing with Annie Clark. She didn't say take him down, Clay. Take the dog down and back, Clay. Go around, Clay. <laughs> But she had another way about her. <laughs> it was kind of more grandiose. But I loved and respected her. Uh, one of the persons, people, that I really should mention that I that did so much for Birgit and I was Winnie Heckman. She really was on our side and, and really did a lot for us. And he was also... Um, who's the, there was another judge I wanted to talk about that I could, would like to go to dinner with. Jimmy Reynolds is very interesting when you go to dinner with him. He's fun, but he's still around, so we need to find somebody that's not here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I, okay, let's, let's go with those, you know, Lang and Annie and Winnie. But, and Winnie was, uh, she was hilarious. And, but what she did was more than anything. She, she just really liked Birgit and I and it really helped us a lot, promoted us, sent us dogs, sent us dogs with good clients. And um, so I have a great deal of appreciation for her. Yeah, we all need those people. It's, those are far a few between again. I, when I was showing dogs, I, remember I was a young handler and Lang was judging and I had a very Famous Irish setter up here. He had just retired on, brought a new dog out. Lang was doing the specialty. And uh, he's, he's talking, he always chatted to me, he called me Will. He, he asked me, is this, is this related to your old dog? And I, I said, I was just being cocky. I said, he was. And I said, yeah, of course he was, right? He gives me off the sex. He told me he didn't never like my old dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. Yeah, that kind of honesty is is good. You know, that's a famous story. Um, he and Harry Sangston were very close. And um, they were betting on um, a basketball game or a football game or something like that. And they bet $100. And, and this, again, was in the 60s. You know, 100 bucks was a lot of money. So Lang is in, he's in Yuma, Arizona, and he, and he gives Harry first in the class. And this is with a Doberman. And this is in the day where Dobermans were a big breed in the mid-60s and 70s. And, you know, there's nothing to have 40, 50 Dobermans. So Lang gives him the blue ribbon, and Harry Sankster has him the $100 bill. <laughs> he says, thanks, Lang. <laughs> 
<laughs> and there's a hundred people standing around there watching this. You know, you couldn't get away with this today. No, no. But you had to know Lang, you know. And Lang goes, Whoa, don't do that. <laughs> so by the way, I just thought of something. I just remembered something. My first time I ever showed in junior hand, junior showmanship, my first dog show, uh, George George Payton. Oh. Yeah. He was the judge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, before he started, I went now around and watched uh, watched uh, uh, the handler that was going to do this. So I followed him around because he knew a couple hours earlier who was going to be the judge. So he's, he gets this ribbon, he gets this best of breed, and he's standing there talking to the judge. And the dog goes to lift his leg on the judge's leg. <laughs> and George caught him. Just, just, in the nick of time. And he made the sign of the sign of the cross. He's, oh my God, he, he got out of that. But it was, it was. Uh, I I just thought, well, this guy's kind of funny, and he be, she should be fun to show her. And I mean, again, I'm only like 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, and I I still thought that was funny. And I never forgot it. And that's you know, that's 1961 or 62. Wow. So not many people know who George Payton is either, do they? No, that's for sure. Yeah, I yeah. Remember. We had a trivia question up here about George, and it was uh, he had won the toy group of the garden with an IG. And nobody knew that up here. I did. <laughs> really? Yeah, he won it in like 1963. I think he won the toy yeah. group of the garden. I knew that because I was, I, I had every dog magazine there was. Now I get those things and I can barely open them. But that's all I thought about when I was a kid. Me too. I used to have stat. We used to have newspapers up here. Dogs in Canada was a newspaper and I used to spend my time circling the dogs I liked and I would pick best dog on page. You know? <laughs> That's not you were a judge already. Yeah. So as a as a you're you're a you were a great handler and you're a great judge. Do you have any advice for uh, a young person that wants to do the sport of dogs as a living? Well, the first thing you want to tell people, because nobody told me how much work it is if you're going to do it, uh, the second thing is keep it a business. I mean, that's probably the one thing that is, has helped me in my whole life is that I kept it a business. Don't give it away. Um, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you, Forrest Hall, do you remember Forrest Hall? Forrest Hall told yeah, me, he is. <laughs> Forrest Hall told me, he signed my handler's application. He and Dick Cooper signed my handler's application. Um, um, the, um, he said, be nice, he said, but not too nice. He says, or they'll walk on you. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, today's a different world. I could have been nicer. You know, I went into a funky time in my life, and I, I got just a little bit too irritating, too irritating to people. I got a little bit too arrogant to talk of things, which I, probably the worst thing I ever did was I wasn't, either raised well enough, um, I wasn't, uh, I, I, I hate to say the word, but I, I actually didn't have enough class not to be arrogant, you know, be more of a politician, like, you know, look at, I mean, not like Trump, but be like, more like a politician, be like a normal politician. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say be, don't be arrogant. Just don't be arrogant. Take care of your dogs. Take care of business. Send your bills out. Okay. And then if they want to know, I made plenty of mistakes. I could tell them the stuff that I did that I wish that I had never done. And I wish that I had never said. And you know, that stuff comes back and you think about it years later and you and you think, God, I wish I hadn't done that, or God, I wish I hadn't said that, or or God, I wish I had done this, <laughs> you know, if I'd have done that, you know, or, um, 
or uh, I, actually, well, this has nothing to do with it, but you know, as I said, when, when I was quitting and, and uh, Carrie, I, I had some kind of a, was told about this dog before Bill got it, this mech, that Carrie. I thought, God, uh, if I kept handling and I had that dog, then I'd be stuck for another three years showing dogs. But um, uh, no, there's there's a lot I could tell people. You know, you know be humble and and uh, don't be arrogant. And have some class. And, and I must say, the whole business has changed. You know, when I showed when I judge dogs, absolutely amazes me the 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 grace, the attitude. Um, and the professionalism that some of uh, some of these handlers have today, what? and I wish that I had that. I really do. I wish, you know, that I had. If I I had known that this is what you really needed to do, I could have done a lot better, and I did well enough. But uh, uh, the world has changed. The dog world has changed in particular, and uh, I'm. Uh, but it's too late. But yeah, I, and as a matter of fact, I do tell people all the time, you know, people who ask me, but not that they work for me or anything like that, but like, you know, what does it take? What would you do? Da, 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 da. Um, and uh, yeah, I would help. I help anyone. I was taught that. That was one of the things they taught you. You give back. You help. You help other people. You kind of answered my next question, though. What advice would you give 20-year-old Clay Cody? You could talk to him now. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You already answered it for me. Be humble and and be, and be careful what you say because you maybe come back to haunt you. you know? Don't be arrogant. That's what I would tell him. And keep it a business, as I said before. That's very important. Okay. <laughs> This has been great, Clay. I really appreciate this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. I was actually very afraid to do this because <laughs> I've never Zoomed before. This is the first time. <laughs> I have to tell everybody I Zoomed with Will, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was great. I really enjoyed this interview. Thanks so much. And uh, I won't keep you any longer, but that, that was great, Clay. I really appreciate it. All righty. Thanks for asking. Well, we'll see you down the road. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see you somewhere. It was great to see you. Okay. Bye-bye. Right, bye. Well, thank you, Clay. That was a very good interview. I'm sure everybody found you inter interesting and fascinating at the same time. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. And don't forget, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. And if you want to find out what's happening at Will's World, go to willalexander.net. And one more plug, if you want to find out about all my grooming seminars and grooming courses, go to Leading Edge Dog Show Academy. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.